Hi, this is Olu Bharti and we are here at KubeCon in San Diego and today we have with us once again Darren Hart, your Senior Director at Open Source Technology Center at VMware. Uh, first of all, welcome to the show once again. Thanks for having me again. From networking perspective, what, what work is VMware doing especially from open source perspective, there are so many networking projects in CNCF. My team in particular uh, has been over the last year focused on things like the network service mesh, as well as the higher level service meshes, so um, such as Istio and Envoy. Um, I think there was a particular focus a bit lower in the stack at the L2, L3 layer. I think there's a bit of separation currently in the way we're talking about these things and a more holistic approach is certainly coming. Um, where we have things like network service mesh focused on the L2 and the L3 abstractions, but we also are talking with Istio and Envoy about top of, top of that stack L7 work, but you also have things like the, the IoT projects out there talking about very similar things to what we're doing in service mesh, and there's not really a clear solution towards simplification. There's a lot of complexity right now um, in, in the networking space. Yeah, you mentioned two projects, SDNY, uh, and when you look at uh, CNC landscape, there are a lot of projects which also overlap mm -hmm. functionality features. At the same time, there are gaps. Mm -hmm. So from networking perspective, what is the situation status right now? So I also mentioned NSM, so Network Service Mesh is yet a third uh, uh, project that's also in, in there with the CNCF. Um, and I think that's where the consolidation story happens. So with each new um, bout of evolution in technology, you see this big chaos stage where there's a lot of redundancy, a lot of overlap. Um, and eventually, the, if you think of each of those projects like a Venn diagram, eventually we find out what the heart of those things are, what those core APIs need to be. You're starting to see that with um, things like the Service Mesh Federation as well as the Service Mesh Interface. Um, and I think there's opportunity too to see more collaboration or more connectivity between the lower level bits of the stack like network service mesh and the upper end of the stack like Istio and Envoy. Um, but exactly what that simplification is gonna be, I, that's part of why we're here. How would you define service mesh? I think it's actually really difficult to quickly define service mesh. And the, the reason is while it does things like allow you to um, programmatically define load balancing um, and to decouple your application from services, it also provides a lot of opportunity to address security issues well beyond what you can do just with TLS, but in terms of what you expose, how things are connected, and which policies you uh, enforce for your, for your application. So it's, it, it's fairly broad in, in what it can do. Um, and so, so to give it a, a stronger definition, we still need to explore that a bit more, I think. If you look at you know, edge computing, which mm -hmm. is kind of going to become uh, really big soon, uh, networking is going to play a massive role there. So a lot of you know, processing, is, all, processing uh, is also moving towards the edge itself. So what are the unique challenges it poses for networking itself? And what is the cloud native community doing in that space? One of the key differences with edge uh, is the, the need for low latency and the number of devices that are being connected. And so there's increasingly a number of discussions here at KubeCon about that. And that's where you have things that start to look a lot like a service mesh. Um, but one of the challenges with things like NSM and, and, and service mesh is they add to overhead. So they add to latency, they add to processing time, they add to footprint. Uh, and just the number of things that you do need to manage. So, so that does present a challenge out at, the, at, out at the edge as well. Kubernetes is really hard to kind of, you know, uh, it's easy to deploy, but hard, there are so many knobs. It's, it's very complicated, you know, piece of technology there. With, with this complexity, how, what impact it makes on the security because there are so many knobs, so many configurations there. I think Ian gave a fantastic keynote this morning um, where they talked about specifically how um, Kubernetes is not now um, secure by default, secure out of the box. As you say, there's a lot of, of components there and you'll see a lot of the cloud providers trying to do things uh, around security and confidentiality, uh, privacy. Um, and, and that's all good because we need to be able to provide a good platform 
for developers to create good solutions that they can ensure are secure um, and provide the confidentiality that they need. But I think we also run the risk of making the, taking the step that we made from a very proprietary environment to the much more, uh, to the APIs and such that Kubernetes provides that are common. And then we're starting to turn back around and starting to see some of those proprietary solutions to the complexity, which takes away a little bit from what we're trying to do. And again, like, like before, this is part of that evolution of technology, right? We get all open and then everyone tries to find a way to make that specific to their, um, their cloud, their data center, their, their solution, their management tools, whatever it happens to be. Um, and so uh, I, I think finding ways to promote these um, abstractions um, at the Kubernetes layer is a way that uh, allows the app developers to not have to develop to this cloud or to that cloud while still having the um, tools that they need and the APIs that they need to not be re-implementing security measures and re-implementing uh, um, um, ways to keep data secure and private. Um, and, and that is, in effect, the open source model. So right now, uh, is the Kubernetes or Cloud Native community looking at security as something you know, they should be worried about, or they're still, you know, still an afterthought? Absolutely, yes. And I think this is a broader, it, it's broader than the Cloud Native community. So open source, in general, um, covers a lot of different domains. And a lot of these domains are starting to overlap, right? Where you're seeing IoT and Kubernetes coming together in one place, for example. Um, something that I think is relevant and reads on this, uh, at the 2019 uh, GitHub Universe, they announced the GitHub Security Lab um, as a, a commitment from various companies to collaborate together to improve the state of open source um, across the board. And, and each company comes and they have some, some intent and some direction that they're looking to do. VMware joined as a founding member. Um, and uh, our team's effort here is to look at securing software supply chain with a focus on uh, community repositories, community content repositories. And so this is a way in which um, no one of us could do this in a way that impacted all of the open source ecosystem that we all depend on. And part of that key message is, you know, none of us can do can do better than what we could do together. And I'll switch gear and talk about your personal life for a second. <laughs> uh, what's the progress going on with your pet project? So, uh, yeah, as we've talked about in the past, I, I'm still involved in architectural visualization. Um, I've, I've, I've hit some of the limits of the tooling that I've been using in the past, and so I've been moving on to try and uh, move to a workflow that uh, primarily uses Blender, um, which works great for me. It's an open source project. All the tooltips list the Python module name that you need to work with, which is just fantastic. Um, and so the, the thing that I've been slowly plugging away at is authoring a plugin for Blender, which allows, uh, w which enables the use of LobWorks high resolution um, plant models. And it's been really fascinating to just dig into something that I've never looked at before and uh, get that, just that instant gratification thrill when suddenly a, a plant shows up and then suddenly the, the leaves are green and then suddenly the textures start to show up. And it, it's been a lot of fun to just reach out as, uh, as an open source developer to a company and say, hey, I'd like to write a plugin for your, for your models. And they reach, they reach out and say, hey, that'd be great. Here's a start of one that we were working on. Do you want to take it over? That'd be wonderful. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. So do, you, do you do this work in the free time or the VMware time? That's a really interesting uh, way to say that. So free time, I'm not sure what that is. Um, and, and you know, I don't have a fixed number of hours in the day, so. It's all mixed, you know, mixed. Yeah. yeah. So I will say open source contribution is a key part of what we do um, at VMware. And it's a key part of what my team does. And um, I encourage my team to work on projects that are relevant to VMware. But I also encourage my team to work on projects that they're just interested in. So some folks on my team make uh, badges for conferences. Some folks on my team um, write software for uh, 3D visualization. 
Some people I report to work on diving applications. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's a big part of who we are. This is an interest of all of ours, yeah. Yeah, because someone was smart enough to hand over the diving application to... <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> or maybe lazy enough to maintain it. They're not different. I mean, It's the same thing, yeah. <laughs> if you're lazy, you have to be smart to get it done. Uh, I think we have covered everything. Okay. Uh, Darren, thank you so much for thank you. Uh, sitting down with me.